I love the Bible because this book is essentially God's heart on paper. It is a love letter written to us, his children. And once I realized that, it just created a brand new passion and a desire for me to get into his word. My mom and I recently started sending letters to each other, old fashioned, handwritten letters delivered in the mail. And when we started doing that, it created a whole new dynamic to our relationship. I can remember the last time I wrote a letter to anybody, let alone my own mom. And what I found was that we became more vulnerable to each other as we write things down on paper. Um, so when I compare that to God's word that's written on paper, um, it, we can read his word over and over again, just like we would when we receive a letter from someone we love. And it, it means more. I think that we get more understanding, especially of the heart of God, when we read his love letter to us a story of, of how much he desires to commune with the people that he made uh, and at the great lengths that he went to for us. One of my favorite passages in the Bible is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And it actually relates to the book, the Bible. Uh, it's where the Apostle Paul is writing to his younger protege, Timothy, and he's telling him the importance of this word and how useful it is in every situation that we may face. He tells Timothy, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I don't know if you like these little brain teasers where you're supposed to take this off this thing and it kind of drives you crazy and you're supposed to oh put this back in the box I guess which is a lot of fun hope I didn't break that um, but that looks like a lot of fun uh, this one you're supposed to take the ring off and there's people who I could take the ring off here really easily if I had like a hacksaw. <laughs> but I think you're supposed to take it off there without breaking anything. But these little, these little brain teasers are sort of designed to be tricky and difficult. And you got to figure them out. And some people look at the Bible and they kind of think the Bible sort of belongs in this, on this table full of brain teasers. How does it work? How does it fit together? It doesn't make sense to me. But I, I don't believe that that's God's plan for his word. I believe that God's word is meant to be understandable and clear and powerful and impact our lives. We've been learning together. Uh, two weeks ago, we talked about the fact that Jesus, that this is the book. The book is the book that Jesus loved and continues to love. Jesus knew this book. He quoted this book. He defended himself with the scriptures, with the words of heaven, the words of God. And so I encourage you to understand that. And then we learned last week that we should love this book. And we ask the question, do I love the word of God? Do I hunger for it? Do I long for it? Do I fill my mind and my heart and my mouth with the words of God? Do I speak these words often? But, but the, the reality of this book goes even further. It's not just a book that brings delight to the heart of God. It's not just a book that should bring guidance and truth and power to our lives. But the book, God's book, this is a book for the world. It's, it's a book for the lost and the broken and the confused, which was me and you before we knew Jesus. But it's not just for us. Sometimes as Christians, we know that God loves the book. We know that he revealed the book, that he, he, he spoke it by his spirit. And we know that we're supposed to read it and understand it and engage with it and grow in the word of God. But what we don't realize is it's not just for us. It's not just enough to have Bible studies, to read our Bible and say, well, I know more of the Bible now. But when, we, when the Bible gets in our hearts and when the word of God gets in our minds, there's something that happens. God propels us out into the world. This is a book 
for the world. And it's a book that teaches us how to love the world and walk into the world in a fresh new way. It's not designed to be complicated and hard to figure out and how it works. And it's not meant to make us pull our hair out or end up frustrated. This book is meant to speak life and truth to us and to people in the world who need the hope and the life and the truth that Jesus reveals in his word. I remember years ago, I was a youth pastor. As a, as a young Christian, I became a youth pastor. And this one young guy, I gave him a Bible, and any, any young person who became a Christian, this guy came out of a home, kind of like I came out of a very non-believing, non-Christian home. And he became a Christian, so I gave him a Bible. And he started reading it, and he loved it. He was, he was reading a bunch of the Bible. As a matter of fact, I had told him, Whatever you read in the Bible, I'll do my daily Bible study, but whatever you read in the Bible, I'll read it too so we can talk about it. And he started reading like three chapters a day and then five chapters a day and then like 10 chapters a day. And I almost wanted to say to him, hey, slow down, man. I got, I'm doing my own Bible study, but I, I was staying up with him and, and he was just loving it. And we talk about what he was learning and God was speaking to him through the scriptures. And then one day we got together and I said, well, what have you been reading the Bible? He says, I haven't been. I stopped reading the Bible. I said, well, why? And he was totally honest. He said, oh, I started finding these things in the Bible that made me feel uncomfortable. I, it, it was telling me things I shouldn't be doing that I like to do or things I should be doing I don't want to do. So I just stopped reading it. Hey, lots of points for honesty. <laughs> he just said, you know what? This book, it's not that the book is unclear. It's that it's so clear. It makes me feel uncomfortable. It's that it's so clear that I understand. It, it pierces, it shows me my sin, my rebellion, my hard-heartedness. We had a great conversation. I said, do you think really you should stop reading the Bible because it disagrees with your life? Or do you think you should align your life with what the Bible says? Well, I think I should probably align my life with what the Bible says. I said, that, that's a better way to go. And then he started reading the Bible again. There is such truth here. There is such power here that God wants to reveal. And in this one book, in this one book that we call the Bible, the book, there's actually 66 books. There's 66 books that make up the whole Bible. And these 66 books with thousands of accounts and stories and poems and songs and prophecies are really all telling one story. This, this whole book from Genesis to Revelation comes back to the same story over and over and over again. That there is a God who made, it, made us, who made you, and made me. There is a God who loves us beyond description. And we have rebelled and sinned and turned from God. And he is seeking to invite us back home. This book shows us that God only sees two kinds of people in all the universe. God sees two kinds of people. Those who've come to faith in him through Jesus Christ and those who haven't come to faith with him in him yet. This book is clear that God sees two kinds of people, those that already understand the gospel, the good news, and they've bowed their knee to Jesus and become his follower and people that he loves and wants to see come to him through faith in Jesus. Now, not everyone does and we can rebel and push away, but it doesn't change the heart of God. And that heartbeat runs from the beginning to the end of the Bible. If somebody says to you, what's the message of the Bible? You can really say this. It's the gospel. It's the good news. There's a loving God who wants to be in relationship with us. We've turned and rebelled and run from him. He's pursued us in love, came to this world from heaven, lived a perfect life and died on a cross for our sins, rose again in glory. He's pursued us and he offers us forgiveness, and we can respond and receive it and then take his hand and walk with him all the days of our life and forevermore. That's the story of the book. So here's the key. It's not just a book for people who are in the family of God and who have received Jesus. This is a book for the world. And one of the reasons we challenge people to go deep, to engage, biblical engagement is one of the markers of spiritual maturity. One of the things about biblical engagement is the more you read the Bible, the more you study it, the more you understand it, the more you hear the heart of God and see the love of God, and that fills us. And then we go out with the love of Jesus. We're sent on mission when we read this book and understand what it says. So let's just do a walk through the Bible. Not all the 66 books, not every passage, but a big picture walk through the Bible. The Old Testament, the first portion of the Bible, the first two-thirds, which we call the Old Testament. 
It points us out into the world. The Old Testament in the Bible points us out with a heart for the world. Right in the book of Genesis, right at the beginning, when God is forming his people, a nation of people who would be his people to bring his love to the world. God calls a man named Abraham, who he renames Abraham. But listen to these words in Genesis 12. If you have your Bibles or if you have your Bible app, go to Genesis 12. At the very beginning, verse 1, we read these words. The Lord had said to Abraham, Go from your country, from your people, from your father's household, to the land I will show you. God says, follow me wherever I lead you, to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him. At the very beginning of the book, as God is shaping a nation and a people, we meet Abraham. And in his call, he is told, listen, I am going to bless you so you can then be a blessing to all the nations, to all the ethnos, to all the people everywhere. I'm not blessing you to say it ends with you, that's enough. I bless you and fill you and pour good things into you so you can overflow and pour into other people. You are blessed so you can become a blessing to the world. That's the heart of God. And that's the call on every single person who puts their faith in in the God of the Bible. That God begins to bless us, but it's always a blessing so that we can in turn become a blessing to others. That's the heart of God. I I think about this idea of being blessed to be a blessing. As a parent, you know that when, when you give something good to your children, you don't want them to be selfish with it. Years ago when our boys were really little, uh, at, at Christmas time, my parents and Sherry's parents would send us money. And we put that money together and we'd get something big for the kids. Instead of getting them each a bunch of little uh, things that broke after a, an hour or a week, we would put all the money together and get one big thing for all three boys. So, so Zach, Josh, Nate each got money from each grandparent. We pulled it all together. And so one year we bought a trampoline. I mean like a full-size trampoline. And I know it's, 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 it's dangerous. You could twist your ankle, but it was so much fun. And we, we actually, I rented a, a, a little bulldozer thing and I dug a hole in the ground and we put the, we put the trampoline, I, I framed it up with wood, put the trampoline in the ground and then we grew grass around the edge so you could literally run and jump on the trampoline from the ground. And then we put a basketball hoop next to it that adjusted so they could do slam dunks off the trampoline Onto the basketball. Well, but what, what if they bumped their head on the rim? They did, and they're still alive. So it was so much fun. Now, I want you to imagine something. Imagine that all three of my boys said, This is our trampoline. No one else can bounce on it. Not our neighbors, not our friends, no one. As a matter of fact, we're jealous of each other, and we're gonna fight for time to be on my trampoline. I mean, I'd, I'd have been heartbroken as a parent. I know that their grandparents would have been heartbroken, but that wasn't what they did. They invited their friends over. They spent, I'll bet you, between the three boys, hundreds and hundreds of hours. They would play horse, you know, where you shoot baskets for horse, but it would be slam dunk horse. There was one kid in our neighborhood who could put a basketball between his heels, stand on a chair on the edge of the tra- off the trampoline with a ball. He could bounce off, jump off the chair, bounce on the trampoline, do a front flip, and slam dunk the ball with his feet and not break his neck. Nobody, if he did it and made it, everyone got an H-O-R-S-E because nobody else could do it. But they had so much fun. It would have been boring if they would have just said, this is mine, I'm not going to share it. When they got the blessing of a trampoline, you get the picture? They became a blessing to their friends. That's true with everything we have. I had time just today at our food pantry. I had a chance to meet with people who were coming to drop food off. And you know that people from Shoreline Church, every Wednesday, they go shopping for their own groceries. But there's people that every Wednesday or Tuesday, they buy extra groceries. They bring two, three, four bags, more, a trunk full of stuff. And they bring it and they give that food to the food pantry. Because on Tuesday and Thursday, people who don't have food to eat come and get food. They say, I've been blessed. I have enough food to eat. But I haven't just been blessed for me. I've been blessed to be a blessing. That's what Christians do. 
And there's nothing that we've been more blessed with than the good news of Jesus. If you are a Christian, if you've come to the cross and received Jesus Christ, you have forgiveness, you have the love of God, you have the family of God, you have heaven as your home. You have what Paul says in Ephesians, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. You have love, joy, peace. You have, you've been lavished. You have been blessed, but not just to keep on and hold on to. You've been blessed to be a blessing. So overflow. And here's the beauty of the good news of Jesus, of the story of his life and death and resurrection. The beauty of the gospel is this. The more you give it away, the more you have. You never run out. You can't give away the love of God too much. You can't tell the story of Jesus too often. You can't pray for people in need too too many times. Pour yourself out. You've been blessed by God. Become a blessing. Abraham at the very beginning is told, God has blessed you so that you will be a blessing. That's what God does with his people. So all through the Bible we're told, think of what you've received from Jesus. Look at your friends and family that don't know him. And say, how can I overflow and share what I've received? I've been blessed. I want to be a blessing. The book of Jonah, all through the prophets, there's this, there's this vision for, for shining the light of God and shining the good news of the coming Messiah. But in the book of Jonah, the whole book is about this idea that God is saying, I love rebellious, hard-hearted, broken people. No one's too far from my grace. And, and the Ninevites, the, the people of this one city, they were, they, they, this was the capital city and they were evil and they were warlike and they were brutal. And the Jewish people did not like them. I would say the Jewish people by and large were terrified of them and in many cases hated them. And if they thought about these people, they would have said, I would, I would wish God's judgment on them for all the cruel things they've done. But God comes to the prophet Jonah and says, I want you to go and preach repentance in the city of Nineveh. Call them to repentance. Well, Jonah looks and says, I don't want them to repent because, God, if they repent, you might give them forgiveness. I want them to be judged. So here's what happens. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. This is in, this is in the book of Jonah, chapter 1, verse 1. And here's the word of God. Go to that great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. Tell them, man, you've sinned. You've been wicked. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. And after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. God says, I want you to call these people, point out their sin and call them to repent. And Jonah says, no way. See, Jonah had been blessed, but he didn't want to be a blessing. He didn't want to overflow to those people, not people like that, not evil people like that. He forgot his own heart, what he was like before he knew the love of God. And so Jonah runs. Well, if you know the story, if you haven't, it's, it's, if you haven't read the story, it's four short chapters. You can read the whole book of Jonah in, in probably less than a half an hour. Read it sometime today. It's powerful. Because God personally delivers Jonah on the shores near, near Nineveh, he goes into Nineveh and he preaches what God called him to preach. If you don't repent, judgment's coming. And you know what happened? They repented. They turned from their wicked ways. And God held back the judgment that they deserved, just like he does with us when we put our faith in Jesus. God is gracious. And, and then when Jonah realizes that God's judgment is not going to come on this city, that fire is not going to fall from heaven and, and destroy these wicked people, when Jonah realizes that, he says, I knew it. God, I knew you were compassionate. I knew you were gracious. This is the worst thing ever. They're not being destroyed. I mean, Jonah's heart was so, he, he's not the model prophet because his heart was in the wrong place. But sometimes for us, we forget that God calls us to share his love even with the most difficult, the most rebellious, the most hard-hearted of people. And it's God's job to change their hearts, but it's our job to share God's truth with them. And as we become a blessing, God then draws people to himself. It's all through the Old Testament. It goes on and on. In 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 the major prophets, the prophet of Isaiah, There's this prophecy 500 years before Jesus came of the Messiah who would come and who would die for our sins, pointing people to the pathway of salvation. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse four, we read, surely he, talking about Jesus, the coming Messiah, he hasn't come yet, but he's coming, prophesying. 
Surely he took up our pain. He bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. For we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Jesus took our iniquity. Jesus took our sin. Jesus took our punishment. And this prophesies of the coming Messiah all through the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, taking our punishment and our shame and bearing our sins, he quotes from Psalm 22, a prophetic psalm, a messianic psalm pointing to the coming Messiah. And Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the cries of my anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, but I find no rest. We realize that while he was hanging on the cross, Jesus, who had been in an eternal community and fellowship with the Father, an eternal oneness with the Father, he felt the separation from the Father because when our sins were placed on Jesus and when the judgment for sin was placed on Jesus, somehow in this mystery of, of the heart of God, Jesus, who was perfectly divine, who'd known perfect community with the Father, felt separate from the Father as sin was being poured on him and punishment was taken by his own choice, by his own willing heart's surrender for our sake. All this is wrapped up in these words in Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We have to understand that the heart of God from the beginning of the Bible is to save lost sheep. This is the heart of God all through the Old Testament. But then we get to the New Testament. We start with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four accounts of the life story of Jesus. And we discover that Jesus called us to bring good news to the world. Jesus didn't just come as the good news. He didn't just come to bring the good news. He came to give the good news to us, to bless us with that good news so we could become a blessing to the world, so that we could be filled and overflowing with this good news of Jesus Christ. It was Jesus who called us salt and light. He said to, to people who would be willing to follow him, you become salt and light when you walk with me and follow me. So in Matthew chapter 5, the, the most famous sermon in the history of the world, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is on this mountainside. There's all these people that have gathered around him and he looks at them and he says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it up on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus says, you're going to be the salt that makes people thirst for the living water that only Jesus can give. You're going to be the light that shines the path and the way to come to Jesus in this crazy, dark world. I mean, Jesus says, this is your mission. You read this book and you recognize that Jesus loved the book, that we're called to love this book, but it doesn't stop with us. When we get immersed in the scriptures, when the scriptures get in our hearts and our minds, we find ourselves going out into the world, praying for people who are lost, praying, looking for lost sheep to invite them to Jesus because that's what Jesus did. Because that's what he called us to do. We find ourselves saying, God, make me a light that shines in the darkness, your light in me. God, let my life be so salty that people thirst for you, Lord Jesus Christ. We get swept into the heart and the mission of God because it's all through the book. And so Jesus called us salt and light. It was Jesus who called ordinary people to pass on his extraordinary message. It was Jesus who took people that you would never have thought that God could use to share the good news, the gospel of Jesus. And he called those people. If you look at the book of Matthew, the first of the four gospels, 
in chapter 9, we see Jesus calling Matthew to follow him. And Matthew is, is in, the, in the tax trade. He's actually Jewish in background, but he's working for the Roman government and really taking money from, stealing money from, and extorting money from his own people. So we read this in verse 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him. They ate with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners, those kind of people? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And listen to this. For I have not come to call the righteous, those who think they're righteous, but sinners. Jesus said, I came for the broken. I came for the sinful. I came for the lost and the hurting. That's the heart of Jesus. And that becomes our heart when we get to know the book that Jesus loved. It was Jesus who died and rose to save us. Jesus didn't just call us on mission. He, he made the way through his life and death and resurrection. In John chapter 19, in verse 28, we, we find Jesus. He's, he's hanging on the cross. He's drawing near the end of a, his life. He's, he's bearing our sin and taking the load that we deserved, taking the consequences of our sin on himself. And in verse 28, we read this. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it and put the sponge on the stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it up to Jesus' lips. When he received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. In the language he spoke, the Greek language, it was one word, tetelestai. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus said, It is finished finished, literally paid, paid in full. Jesus is being clear that the price for our sins was paid by him on the cross. We don't carry that load anymore if we'll receive Jesus Christ. He takes it for us. He bore our sins. He took our shame. He took the punishment. And he said, it's finished. And there's nothing we can add to that. And then it was the risen Messiah who called us to make followers of all nations. After Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished. He died. They buried him. For three days, he was dead in the tomb. And on the third day, Easter Sunday, he rose from the dead in glory. And the stone was rolled away. And Jesus in victory and in glory was resurrected. And during that time of his resurrection, before he ascended back to the Father... He taught small groups and large groups. He shared meals with people before he ascended, post-resurrection, pre-ascension. And Jesus, this is one of the things that Jesus said to some of his followers that were gathered in Acts chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. Jesus said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. You will be a witness to me in Jerusalem, right where you live, in Judea, the surrounding community, in Samaria, the other side of the tracks, the tough places that a lot of people avoid, and the ends of the earth, the furthest places you can think about. He says, you're going to be my witnesses. That's the words of Jesus. When you know that this is the book that Jesus loves, when you begin to love this book, when you immerse yourself in the scriptures, it doesn't just become more knowledge for you. You discover that you are blessed to be a blessing and you start to overflow with this greatest gift of all, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the hope of eternal life, a relationship with the living God through Jesus Christ. When we have these things, how can we not share them? I mean, I, I, I'd have been so disappointed in my kids if they wouldn't share a trampoline. Imagine if we don't share the greatest gift in the history of the world, and it's free. Jesus paid the price. It's finished. 
We just get to offer it to others. We don't force them to receive Jesus. We don't pressure them. We can't change people's hearts, but we can share. Do you want to come? Do you want to join us? Can I tell you about, about the joy it is to walk with Jesus? We invite people in. That's what we get to do. It's glorious. The life, the message, and the call of Jesus was radical mission. Jesus was about us going on mission. He left the glory of heaven to come on mission and to save us. He has us here today to be on mission, to share his good news with others. We get the joy and the privilege of being part of that. But it continues on as you walk through the Bible. The Apostle Paul, who wrote more books in the Bible than anybody else, inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul presented a mission mindset for God's people. He presented this whole mindset that was all about mission. Look at these words in 1 Timothy 1, beginning in verse 15. You know, Paul had been fighting against the gospel, fighting against Jesus. The Holy Spirit came upon him. He became a follower of Jesus, radically converted. But he shares these words later in life, looking back. And he says in verse 15 of 1 Timothy 1, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst, he says. I'm the worst of sinners. He had been killing Christians before he became a Christian. Christ, did, he says, but for that very reason, I was, sh I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The apostle Paul says, if Jesus could save a killer of Christians, a destroyer of churches, somebody who came and crushed Christian homes and families and communities, if Jesus could save me and if his gospel could wash me clean and if he could give me new life and then use me to tell others about him, here's what Paul says, he can use anybody. He can use anybody. A self-centered surf punk who grew up in a non-Christian home. Can God use a person like that? Sure he can. A person with your story, your journey, can he use you to share his love and his good news? Of course he can. That's what God does best. He takes the broken things in this world and he heals them and fixes them and then he makes us something useful for his glory. And the apostle Paul, who understood this truth, he wrote a book to the Christians in the city of Rome. And, and there's all kinds of passages in the book of Romans that, that really kind of show a pathway. Some people call it the Romans road, this journey of faith to Jesus Christ. I want to walk you down that Romans road that the Apostle Paul was inspired by the Spirit to write. And these are verses found in the book of Romans. And, and I want to share it in the context of a, I had a conversation uh, with, with a guy named Jim. Jim came from a Catholic background. He told me, I, was, I grew up as a devout Catholic. I said, what did that mean? He said, well, that meant we went to church a couple times a year and we were baptized. And I said, okay, I get, your, get the picture of what devout Catholic means to you. But we were talking about faith and what it meant to really know and walk with Jesus. And it was all pretty new to him. So I was sitting, we were sitting in a restaurant, and I had my Bible with me. So I just said, well, Jim, you know, can we read a couple passages of the Bible together? And he said, sure. He said, I haven't really read the Bible much. I said, well, it's not very complicated. And so I, I'm going to read passages. I, what I kept doing is I kept saying, well, here's a passage. I had them actually highlighted in my Bible. So I said, okay, here's one. Here's Romans 5, 8. I turned and I said, it's, it's highlighted in blue there. I turned it around and I put it in front of him. And he read it, and we talked about it. And at the end of this conversation, he understood the story of Jesus in a whole new way. So here's that simple Romans road that I walked with with my friend Jim that you could walk and share with somebody else or maybe you're not yet a follower of Jesus and you need to see the simple road to faith in Jesus Christ. Here it is from the book of Romans. Romans 5.8 shows us the amazing love of God. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God loves us so much that he gave his only son for us before we ever said we wanted him. That's love. The good news of Jesus is that God loved you and loved me before we loved him. And if you don't love Jesus yet, he loves you right now. And Jesus came for you. So that's God's love. And then you continue on in Romans. In Romans 3.23 and 6.23, we see our problem. God loves us, but we have a problem. Romans 3.23 says this. 
For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've sinned. We've, done, we've had wrong thoughts and bad thoughts and spoken words we shouldn't have spoken and done things we shouldn't have done and failed to do things we should have done. We've all done wrong against God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our problem is that we've sinned and that sin spiritually separates us from God. And ultimately when there's physical death, it leads to spiritual death. It is heartbreaking. But that's the truth of our sin. And the Apostle Paul shows us in Romans. That's why I showed this to my friend Jim and that made sense to him. And then we continued on. God's solution. Romans 8, 3-4. What's God's solution? We, if we're lost in sin, if we're separated from God, how do we get that healed? How do we get that fixed? Romans 8.3 says, For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. Jesus came to be the offering to pay for our sins. And so he condemned sin in the flesh. Our sin can be condemned by the death of Jesus and washed away in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Paul says, listen, Jesus paid the price you couldn't pay. And if you receive Jesus Christ, his payment becomes your payment. And, his, and, and, and the freedom becomes your freedom. So God's solution is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that he offered for us and for our sins. And then our response. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. And I share this with my friend Jim, and I'll share it with you. From Romans 10, 9. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. When you say he's Lord, you say he's in charge. He's the master. He's the leader. I give my life to him. It's a surrender of your life. Jesus, if you say with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You declare it, you believe it, you're saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Right through Romans, this beautiful road that shows that God loves us, that we're separate from him, we've messed up, but God's made a way through Jesus, and if we receive it, in our hearts and with our mouths and declare it, we can be made clean and washed clean. And then Romans 12, 1 and 2 sort of gives our joyful journey to Jesus. Now we take the hand of Jesus and we've received him. Now we walk with him all the days of our life. So Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies, your whole lives, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The great thing about the gospel is it doesn't end at the cross and the empty tomb. It continues all of our lives. And we, we get shaped into the image of Jesus Christ to be more and more like him. I want to give an invitation today. For those of you that have never really understood the simple good news of the gospel, you've never really understood that, that God loved you even though you may not know him and may not have loved him, God loves you anyways. That you've sinned and lived in ways that are unpleasing to God and that separate you from God, but that God loved you so much, he came into this world. Christmas, Jesus' birth, God came to die for you and to rise again. That's Easter. And then if you'll just receive his grace, you will have new life. And he will take your hand and you will take his hand and you'll walk with him all the days of your life. I want to invite you, if you've never prayed to receive Jesus Christ, right where you are right now, in the quiet of your heart, will you join me in this prayer? And if you're a Christian and you're hearing this, would you recommit your heart to follow Jesus as I pray? Let's pray together. For those of you that have never received Jesus, would you just say to him right now in your heart, oh dear God, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for loving me before I loved you. Thank you for seeing all my sins and all my wrongs and loving me anyways. I confess my sins. 
I confess all the wrongs of my life, all the thoughts I shouldn't have thought, the things I shouldn't have said, the actions I shouldn't have done. I just, I give them all to you, Jesus. I can't pay for them, Jesus, but you can. So Jesus, take my sins. And when you died on the cross, Lord, let my sins be washed away. No longer mine, but taken upon you and thrown in the deepest sea. I commit to follow you all the days of my life, to take your hand, to take your love, to be part of your plan for my life, and to walk with you from this day until I see you face to face and enter heaven one day because I put my faith in you. I pray this in your name, Jesus, and for your glory. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, will you do one thing right now? There's a number on the screen. Will you text this one word, faith, F-A-I-T-H. You just put your faith in Jesus. Text the word faith to that number and we will follow up with you and just see if we can help you on this journey of taking the hand of Jesus and growing. We want to come alongside of you. Will you please just take a minute and text the word faith and then we'll respond and ask you, can we help you along the way? Because the next step of your life is the most important. You received him now. Now you walk on this journey of growing in faith in Jesus Christ. For all of you that are already followers of Jesus, keep holding his hand tight and walking with him. And understand that that this book, from the beginning to the end of the book, God shows, the book shows God's great love and calls Christians to share it with the world. Whether you've been a Christian for three minutes or 30 years, you have a story to share with the world. When we know the book, we're moved out into the world. And so I want to pray for God to send us with a new passion that we would know that we're blessed to be a blessing and the greatest blessing is sharing the good news of Jesus. Let me pray for you to do that and then a couple of words of announcement before I send you off with a word of blessing. God, for each person who's a follower of yours, we pray that we would love your book. We would love the Bible. We would feed on it and be filled with it and then we would be moved to share your love in the world because Lord, your book calls us from beginning to end to recognize that we have been blessed and we're called to be a blessing, that we are called to be light, that we are called to be salt, that we are called to be witnesses wherever we are. So Lord, propel us by your spirit out into the world with more prayer and love and sharing of your good news. We pray this for your glory. Amen. I want to give you a word of blessing, but a couple quick announcements first. First, if you want prayer for anything, call the number on your screen in just about one minute and someone will be waiting there to pray with you. If you're new to Shoreline, you're anywhere in the world, and you're new to Shoreline, would you text the word WELCOME to the number you see on the screen now? And what we will do is we will follow up and make sure we get to know you a little bit. Also, if you want a Bible, uh, we want to send you this exact Bible. And if you want a Bible, will you just text the word BIBLE to the number you see on the screen? But here's the key. When you send that text, we can't send you a Bible. Here's why. We don't know who you are or where you live. So when you you text Bible, we're going to send you back a link, fill out the information so we can send this to you. And about 40 people a couple weeks ago texted the word Bible but didn't fill out the link and you haven't got your Bible yet. The reason is we don't know where to mail it. So please fill out that information and let us send you a Bible. We would be delighted and honored to do that. And then, again, if you made a commitment to Jesus, if you prayed for the first time to receive Jesus, text the word FAITH to the number you see on the screen. Finally, if you have questions about anything in the life of Shoreline, when's this starting? When are we doing that? Whatever it is, you just, you just email the number on the screen right there and we will get back to you and answer your questions. As I send you off with a word of blessing, I would invite you, if you're comfortable doing this, just to turn your hands like this, like someone's going to pour a bunch of M&Ms or blueberries or something you really want to eat, kind of, your hands ready to receive and just receive these words of blessing. May you take the book that Jesus loves and read it often. May it become the book that you love above all other books. And as you read the book of Jesus, may he inspire and call you and send you out into the world overflowing, blessed to be a blessing with the good news of Jesus. God bless you. Bless someone else this week and we'll see you back here next Sunday online or on campus. God bless you.